Hey, I'm Jim Blackburn. I'm real happy to be here. And uh, what I'd like to do is talk with you today about what I consider the most exciting idea I've run across, you know, perhaps in my career. I mean, of course, I've been a lawyer for most of my career, and some of the things I run across there haven't been particularly exciting at all. So <laughs> now I'm working more on the, I think, the problem solving side of things. And I think ecosystem services markets has the potential to really uh, kind of transform, I think, the uh, prospect in the future for landowners as well as for prairie conservation and other ecosystems of conservation. The work I'm doing got started because of Hurricane Ike. Uh, Hurricane Ike, uh, those of you that were down here on the coast, I mean, basically, the Houston area dodged a bullet. It caused horrible damage in uh, Bolivar, uh, you know, just wiped out uh, all of the existing development on Bolivar, a lot of backside damage to Galveston Island and to the city of Galveston, and uh, some low-lying areas, Kima, Seabrook, right along the bayfront, so suffered substantial damage. But we really didn't get hit like we could. And uh, Houston Endowment funded us over at Speed Center at Rice to look into ideas. And we're working on a lot of structural ideas, but this is a graphic that really caught our attention. Harris County Flood Control District put it together. And Hurricane Ike, which came ashore right up in this area here, and the dirty side was all back here to the east, it, that is depth of flooding. And the surge that came in with Hurricane Ike uh, was up over 10 feet deep halfway into Chambers County. Uh, it was a huge storm. Not wind speed wise, but surge wise and width of the storm. I'm convinced this is one of our modern, what I'll call climate change storms, and it's a little different than anything we'd ever seen in the past. And so I flooded everything all the way over to Grand Isle, Louisiana. But this is an image Brian Carlisle took four days after I, and this is basically the little chenier barrier between the Gulf of Mexico, which is right here, and these are the marshes in, uh, in this case, Jefferson County. And this is water running back off of the landscape four days after the storm had passed. And then that's what it looked like six to nine months later, compared to Baltimore, which was, you know, just still in ruins nine months later. That natural system recovered, and so we were really struck with the resiliency of that system compared to the human systems that we built. And this is the area we're concerned about. That's uh, Chambers in Jefferson County, and this line here is the 20-foot contour line, and we figure a 20-foot surge is a reasonable planning horizon. And so we were looking at what could be done all down through Galveston, Brazoria, and and I did have the funniest thing or the weirdest thing happen to me. I actually had the county judge from Matagorda County call up and ask to get involved in the study. Uh, we were looking at both this and the Lone Star Coastal National Recreation Area, which is an ecotourism concept. And he said he would like Matagorda County to be in. And I don't know if any of you know much about my career, but I usually don't have county judges that calling and asking to be involved <laughs> in what I'm involved with. So, I, I knew I was onto something different when I was heading in this direction. Well, did it give up the ghost? It gave up. Next slide. Okay. So one of the, what we got to thinking is that 20-foot contour line. Is there a way we can come up with an economic solution for that area? It's all privately owned for the most part. It's about 200,000 acres of uh, protected lands. Uh, some development in Galveston County particularly, but mostly it's in private hands. And we were trying to figure out what economic concepts we could come up with to help these uh, private people. Next slide, please. And we didn't start here, but this is actually what we ended up working with, is something called the circular economy. Uh, I think this is going to be the economy of the future. But basically, we're talking about an economy that conforms with the natural cycles as opposed to one that works against it. I mean, if you look at our current concept of economy, it's all of these graphs that go like that. I mean, it's all about a straight line projection to the moon, uh, really with no limits, with no boundaries. And the natural system doesn't work that way. The natural system works in cycles and circles. And there are those that are now working very hard to try to begin to reshape 
uh, the United States economy, the global economy, into these cycles and circles. And here in Houston, we have certainly the carbon cycle, which carbon is naturally recycled. The water cycle is naturally uh, recycled. But we also have, in terms of crabs and uh, uh, shrimp, fin fish, we have essentially a cycle going out into the Gulf and back into the estuary. And we also have the bird cycle, then where the birds move through here. So there's at least kind of four natural cycles our economy needs to be, or could be, in tune with. Next slide. So when we talk about a circular economy, we're talking about one that's restorative and regenerative as part of its characteristics. It's focused upon really minimization of carbon, water, and ecological footprint. It's got efficiency, it's got renewables, and it's got neutrality of impact. And it's that neutrality of impact that's going to really become, I think, the key element. Next slide, please. Now, this is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the emerging markets. One of the, you know, you've all heard about LEEDS, you've all, uh, there's another engineering certification called the Envision ISI system. The hardest of all of these challenges is the living building challenge. And this is how they define themselves. To be successful in the living building challenge, you've got to move from essentially traditional, which is negative environmental impact, up through a transition where you become regenerative rather than negative. And then the top up there is what the living building challenge is trying to achieve. I think that's what we're going to see as our economic goals in the future. And I think you're starting to see that. Next slide. The one thing we've got in abundance here is actually wealth of ecology and ecological systems. It's our best kept secret. Uh, I'm convinced that because we're an oil town, basically, uh, if you're in the oil business, you're in, you know, you take natural resources. And I don't think those in the oil business like to get attached to natural resources because they might be drilling on them at some future time, or at least they seem to think that way. I don't know why. That's the only thing I've come up with. If we had these ecological resources in any town on the west coast or the east coast of the United States, you'd know all about it. You would have heard it, it would have been broadcasted, it would have been talked about. But we're not on the east coast or the west coast, and it's our best kept secret, but it's something I hope to take full advantage of. Next slide, please. Now, I've been talking ecology in this community for a long time, but I can promise you I can hold every audience in this town interest with this slide. If I can talk money and ecology, I can have a conversation. If I talk about my spiritual connection or my personal commitment or stewardship, oh man, you know, I'd get people looking in all directions. I, you know, a few people certainly are interested in that. But if I can talk money and ecology together, I can keep most people's attention. And I really think this is going to be a key element of the future. Something else I think, certainly from the environmental perspective, Environmentalists don't always make others comfortable. And part of that is talking in a language they're, they're familiar with or that they are comfortable with. And this is a language that, at least in terms of Houston business people, they're comfortable with this conversation. And so we can talk about things that we might not be able to talk about otherwise in this context. Next slide. Now, the starting point of basically the dollar value of ecology is an environmental economist named Robert Costanza. And he wrote this fabulous article for Nature magazine back in 1997 that really got the conversation going in this direction, where he came out with the value of the world's ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are, is really the work that the ecosystem does. It's kind of the natural functions. And if engineers had designed it, we'd charge for it. But because it's nature, we, and nature is doing it. It's sort of a gift that we got. It's a lot of wonderful work being done, but it's natural, and so we don't think about paying for those services. And so keep that distinction in mind. Next slide. Now, in the book that I wrote in 2004 on the Book of Bays, I took Costanza's basic information and translated it into acres and dollars per acre. But basically, an estuary like Galveston Bay, he ranked at about $11,000 per acre per year. Uh, something like, a, oh, over here, Tidal Marsh or Mangroves, he had it about $5,000. Over here, we've got, oh, what's that, swamps and floodplains up about $9,000 per acre per year. 
And so I took that, and this has to do with the services, everything for, for, from producing fish to removing nitrogen and phosphorus to various functions that go on that if you had to design or had to build it or pay for it, it would be worth a lot of money. And so I took, next slide please, I took the values from Costanza's book or article, I took a GIS system and looked at what was being, what the resource base we had on the Texas coast, how many acres of these different ecosystems did we have, and I broke it down on a beta, 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 beta basis. Galveston Bay came in at about five billion dollars per year. I mean, it's a fair amount of money. Uh, that began to catch people's attention, uh, but in a way nobody really got too excited about this because a lot of these values are nitrogen and phosphorus removal, and no one's being required to remove nitrogen and phosphorus, so while there's value there, yeah, nobody's really going to pay. So what I heard back was, well, this is fine, it makes sense, we're glad to have this information, but nobody, these, are, these numbers aren't real. Next slide. So, when we're talking about ecological service transactions, we've got to be careful about theoretical versus actual, and it really becomes a key thing is where are the markets going to emerge, and I, I'll keep coming back to that, but I want to emphasize that. Um, Basically, the idea is that, and we're changing our newer, I hadn't changed these slides yet, but in our newest slides, seller has been changed to landowner. Basically, the landowners are going to be the beneficiaries of these transactions. Everything we're doing is to benefit whoever happens to own the land. Buyers is a diverse group. Next slide, please. Now, hit, hit the button several times, just these, these will fill out, and I'll stop when you get down here to the bottom, please. Okay, this is the regulatory ecosystem service market. Now, one of the things we environmental lawyers created was a market for ecological services with the environmental laws we created and worked with. And we didn't necessarily mean to do this. This sort of evolved. It was sort of a response. Now, sulfur dioxide trading, that market was created in 1990 with the Clean Air Act, and basically we figured out, not necessarily scientifically, how much sulfur dioxide the United States could absorb in the atmosphere, and then we've allocated it, and we created a market, and that's about a four and a half billion dollar market today. Conservation banking is emerging, a lot of landowners, particularly in the Midwest and in uh, West Texas, you're starting to see basically if the oil companies or if wind farms come in and take land, they have to pay for offset, basically based on endangered species. Uh, you get the um, uh, habitat conservation plan concept. That's about an $800 million market, and that will expand. Total allowable catch is about fishing. Wetland mitigation banking, which many of you may be aware, about, aware of, is under the Corps of Engineers regulatory program, and it's about a $3 billion market. Uh, today. Carbon dioxide trading, which is the big one that I want to talk about, is really just beginning in the United States, and it's going to explode. And transfer of development rights, natural resource damage assessment are two other areas that I expect to see a lot more on, particularly the, the NERDA concepts, but I'm not going to cover that today. Next slide. Some of the most interesting ones I've run across. Heat is a problem in the Willamette River in Oregon. And Power companies were looking at having to put bigger chilling units, either some sort of like cooling uh, tower or some type of system to remove heat. But what they figured out is they could pay landowners to plant trees and create shade, reduce BTU content in the water, and therefore get their, achieve their heat reduction goals through basically planting trees. Uh, and they, were pay, they are paying landowners to plant trees, and in exchange, they, the power companies are escaping the requirement to engineer a solution. <laughs> Dow Chemical is proposing a similar thing down in the Columbia Bottomlands, down in Brazoria County, with planting a thousand acres of trees to remove nitrogen oxide. Rather than engineer a system, they're going to use a natural system. And there's lots of examples. Next slide. So, 
The problem that I've hit head on with what we're doing, we've got a regulated market, and it's basically balanced out right now. And we've got ecological capital value, but there's value that has that's going to be recognized that's not required by regulation. And it's that voluntary market that we want to hit and that we're trying to hit. And so the rest of this presentation is going to be about that voluntary market. Next slide. Again, we're looking at this strip in here, which basically is marshlands, prairie, and uh, Columbia bottomlands, forest areas, and the estuaries. But so we've really got four ecosystems that we're working with in our initial area. Just a concept of what we have in mind, carbon farms. Um, I think that's what the future is going to be, it's going to be on carbon farming. And carbon farming's along the, the coast, and flood storage as well. And so our goal, frankly, was flood storage. Our goal was to create a buffer along the coastline that would be not developed, not because of regulation, but because the landowner was making more money on another deal. And that's what our goal is, and I think we'll be able to uh, cause that to happen in some way or another. Next slide. So we're trying to set up a trading platform. We're building a geographic information system over at Rice. We hope to have it up early next year that will potentially link buyers and landowners. And basically, if a landowner is interested in selling something, they can flag themselves and a potential buyer can find out who they are and can meet with them. I don't think we're going to be in the 